recruit, and welcome to Astroneer Academy 505 Automation Logistics. In our last course, we took an in-depth look at several scenarios using automated production. In each of these, our natural resources were readily available because I chose the locations based upon the resource node without consideration to their proximity to the base or a landing site. In an ideal situation, you would want your automated production created in storing items and resources in a location that is convenient. That way you can just hop in a shuttle, pick up what you need, then continue on about your tasks. To solve this problem, we turn to Automated Logistics, where we will investigate how to use automation to sort, move, store, and fetch items and resources. But you might be asking yourself, what is automation logistics? To make the answer to that question easier, let's first define logistics. Logistics essentially is the word used to describe the management of the flow of things from their point of origin to their point of consumption. Those things that need to move about for an astroneer would be resources and objects that can be crafted. And so automation logistics simply involves the flow of resources and objects consumed or created via automation. This side of automation investigates how things like sensors, switches, storage, and auto arms are used to move things about inside the bigger picture of overall automation. In one of my recent adventures, I decided to take on the challenge of producing as many resources as possible in one place without needing to bring resources in from other planets. I also wanted to ensure that all the created resources were stored at a fairly central location. This meant I not only had to do careful planning, taking into consideration which natural and atmospheric resources were available on each planet and moon, but I also needed to move a lot of resources over fairly significant distances. Let's take a look at a few of these setups and how I used automation logistics in each one. This huge mess here on Calador is producing a huge number of resources. It all began with a desire to have automated hydrazine production so I could simply drop in, pick up a medium canister or two full of hydrazine, and then continue on with what I was doing. When I first set out, I couldn't find two large ammonium nodes near an existing landing spot, so I brought my own landing pad to place near the two ammonium nodes that I found. Then I set up two auto extractors with a chemistry lab and atmospheric condenser roughly in the middle. I then used some platforms and auto arms to bring all of the ammonium from the auto extractors to the chemistry lab. Then it only took a couple of hours for all 12 medium canisters to fill up with hydrazine, meaning everything was sitting idle. Each time I visited Calador to grab some hydrazine, I couldn't help but feel as though all of the power producers were going to waste. That's when I got the idea to expand my production. Just beyond my initial solar array and battery power station, there is wolframite and graphite mixed together with some resin. I wanted to begin refining wolframite and use the graphite to make some graphene. So I installed two more auto extractors and a lot more platforms and auto arms to bring everything over to my hydrazine production area, creating something resembling a conveyor belt. I was able to make branches off that main belt by filtering for various resources. The graphite was sent onto the chemistry lab I installed right next to the hydrazine storage, while the wolframite was sent off to the side to head to a smelter. The resin was simply a byproduct, and a third auto arm was filtered to simply store it. Once everything was up and running, I was a bit shocked at how quickly I had full canisters of graphene and tungsten. So I decided to add in a couple more canisters to store graphite and wolframite, and those filled up quickly. That's when it really hit me that I could do a lot more in this location. Another chemistry lab was introduced to take the graphene and create diamonds, while over by the tungsten, I added in a soil centrifuge and smelter for some carbon and another chemistry lab to make tungsten carbide. And while I was at it, I brought in another atmospheric condenser to collect sulfur and even automated the production of explosive powder. I plan on automating the production of dynamite soon, so I always have some boom boom sticks on hand to help me crack open exocaches to obtain exochips. Then I headed down into a nearby cave and was fortunate enough to discover both laterite and malachite in close proximity, which meant I could refine copper and aluminum for storage while also using them to produce and store aluminum alloy. 
By the time it was all said and done, I had nearly a dozen different resources being stored in close proximity to my landing pad. And this was all made possible by automation logistics. The large extended platform is the true hero in all of this. Without those, moving resources over large distances would have been much more complicated. I would have needed to resort to utilizing other platforms and storage while ensuring each auto arm was properly aligned so it could continue moving resources where they needed to go. But with a large extended platform, I know each end is perfectly spaced for an auto arm, so a lot of the work was simplified. Now I only need to worry if one auto arm can reach the end of the previous large extended platform. I could have simply collected each resource and storage at each auto extractor and brought them back to my base to refine them and create composites. But by taking the time to set up automation logistics, I didn't have to do that work. The resources were automatically moved where they were needed and everything was stored within a few steps of my landing pad. Sure, a lot of it looks like a mess and that's because it is. If I had gone into the original hydrazine production, knowing I was going to automate so much in one place, I probably would have come up with a much more organized, less messy configuration. But even if it is cluttered, it functions incredibly well. I would be remiss if I didn't pause here to talk about one glaring issue with utilizing this much stuff for logistics. Power. Each and every auto arm consumes one unit per second, even when it is inactive. If memory serves me correctly, the auto arms alone are usually nearly 50 units per second in total. Because of this, I needed a lot of power. This meant I not only needed a lot of solar panels, but I also needed a whole lot of batteries to ensure things kept running at night. But to be honest, all of the hard work in getting power production capable of supporting everything was well worth it. There have been dozens of occasions where I needed a resource that was ready and waiting for me on Calvador. So when I was in the middle of a project, I didn't need to stop and first create the resources I needed. Instead, I was able to get them from Calador and continue on with my projects. But Calador can only yield a certain number of resources. For things like steel, silicone, and titanium alloy, I'd have to set up automated production on other planets and moons. On Glacio, I had a huge deposit of hematite right in the middle of my base, so steel production wasn't a big deal. I already had power and its location inside of my base means I didn't need to move much around. On Novus, I was able to get silicone production up and running fairly simply. But titanium alloy proved to be the spot where I found myself relying on automation logistics the most. Vasanya is the only place where you can create titanium alloy without needing to bring in resources from other planets. It has ammonium and hydrogen for hydrazine, it has graphite for graphene, and it has titanite and nitrogen for titanium alloy. So I started exploring Vasanya in hopes of finding graphite, titanite, and ammonium all near each other. Titanite and graphite weren't that too difficult to find, but I quickly discovered that the only place ammonium really exists in high enough quantities on Vasanya was deep inside the planet. Since it was going to be the biggest portion of this project, I began with a good deposit of ammonium deep inside the planet and set about creating enough large extended platforms and auto arms to bring that ammonium all the way back to the surface. To be honest, I lost count of how many platforms and auto arms run all the way down down the ramp, but I think it's over 60 of each. On the bright side, I did find the nice lithium deposit in the first cave layer rather close to my platforms and auto arms. This made it easy to get an auto extractor and storage in place since I already had power running down in the caves via the conveyor belt for ammonium. And that's another really nice upside to using automation logistics for production. Instead of needing to create several power stations at various locations across the planet to gather each resource, power is carried through each platform instead. This allows you to create one central power station and not really have to worry about utilizing extenders or other methods of getting power where you need. And as a bonus, oxygen is carried through all of those platforms as well, meaning you don't need oxygen tanks, filters, or a portable oxygenator while you're working. Back on the surface of Asanya, I had hydrogen being produced that was fed into a chemistry lab along with ammonium, creating the hydrazine that would be necessary to produce graphene. This meant I now needed to turn my attention to getting graphite and titanite back to the production area. 
While it was not at the same scale as the Ammonium line, each one still took a considerable number of platforms and auto arms to get everything moving and to sort out unwanted resources gathered by the auto extractors. In hindsight, I could have saved myself a lot of time and scaled back power production if I had set my production area and landing pad closer to the Titanite and Graphite. Ammonium is so plentiful near the center of the planet, I could have drilled down practically anywhere and found enough to bring back to the surface. But that is, of course, hindsight, and at least I had the opportunity to really push automation logistics to its extreme. And now I had a second source of graphite and graphene, along with all of the titanium and titanium alloy I could ever hope to use. And I never have to stop and wait to produce any of it. But automation logistics is not just about moving stuff over long distances. In fact, the simplest form of automation logistics comes to us via the small but effective filtering slot on the auto arm. The simple act of filtering an auto arm is a logistical solution in and of itself. And that powerful little filtering slot can help us accomplish some truly great things. Not everyone is going to have the time or patience to create automation on the scale that we have just looked at. But that doesn't mean automation logistics can't help you in your day-to-day -day adventures. Have you ever gone out to collect resources and wind up bringing back a additional resources as well? It's fairly easy to do. You put a drill on your rover and you went mining for ammonium and you wound up back at your base with ammonium, compound, resin, organic, and maybe even some malachite and graphite. You could stop and manually sort each of those resources out into their own storage canister, or you could let automation logistics handle that sorting for you. You're looking at a fairly compact automatic vehicle unloader and sorter. To help ensure that the auto arms don't randomly grab things when a vehicle is not being unloaded, we have a couple of sensor arches. It doesn't really matter which direction you drive through, and to be honest, you could get away with just a single sensor if you're willing to back up when you leave. But I'm using two, and they trigger the auto arms on and back off when a vehicle approaches and leaves, respectively. All I need to do is park my vehicle so that its attached storage is in range of the first auto arm and then sit back while everything is automatically unloaded and sorted. There are a couple of key things to point out for this setup, however. First, it is important that the medium resource canisters are on the back side of the silos. If they are on the front, the auto arms can reach the canister input and you'll often wind up with one resource going into two or more different canisters, breaking the sorting functionality. Second, you need to fill the front slots of the silo with tier two items. Any tier two items will work so long as all of those slots are filled. This prevents the auto arms from trying to utilize those slots as storage and, since the objects are tier 2, also prevents the auto arms from moving those objects as well. You could even expand upon this to automatically unload multiple tractor trailers or rover trains as well. You'd simply need to move your sensors farther apart and then incorporate the necessary platforms and auto arms to redirect resources from connected trailers or rover trains over to the main sorting arm. It might not be apparent at first, but but there is some elegant simplicity in this setup. It is able to sort all 15 natural resources without first priming any medium storage canisters and without filtering any auto arms. Numerous other automatic sorters I've seen have to meet one or both of those conditions to function, meaning they occupy more space at your base and require more resources to construct. So I wanted something that required as few resources as possible while occupying as little space as possible. And this is what I came up with. Well, I had a lot of help Help from several other pro-level astroneers, including Electric Ron, Bruin, Warfrat A54, Michael Hun, Genopedia, and Anton79313. They were all present when I went through several iterations of this auto sorter, and they helped me work out the bugs to come up with the final design. This exact same automatic vehicle unloader and sorter can be utilized for unloading shuttles with just one small change. You simply need to remove the sensor arch for a rover and replace it with one of the extra large sensor hoops. When you land in your shuttle, it will trigger the auto arms to begin unloading. 
The only limitation to this setup is that, as we discussed in Ashton Junior Academy 503, a shuttle will not always trigger the sensor again on takeoff, which means your auto arms might remain active. And that is just one example of how automation logistics can help you with a common everyday task. Let's look at another example that utilizes several medium sensor arches and auto arms for something a bit more fun. For copyright purposes, I am going to call this the Anthony Sharp contraption, because Anthony is short for Tony and Sharp is a synonym for Stark. Anyway, what you are looking at will let you walk through the subsequent sensors and have the auto arms completely fill your backpack with everything you need for your day's adventures. I experimented with this for quite a while and the order of objects loaded does matter. You can choose whatever you'd like to equip as long as you remember this order. Your first three auto arms need to be reserved for items you wish to carry on the three slots of your terrain tool. So this is where you would want to place drills or other terrain tool related items and maybe a soil canister or a power item. The next several auto arms need to be reserved for items you wish to carry on the main slots of your backpack, ensuring that you are filling all eight slots. If you don't want several of the same item, you can use a sensor arch to create separate sections for loading different items. Your final two auto arms are reserved for the two items you wish to carry on your backpack shoulder widget slots. There are a few power switches in play here as well, and they are controlled by the sensor arches. As you walk through the first sensor arch, it turns on the power switches connected to the platforms with the first set of auto arms. When you walk through the second sensor arch, it simultaneously turns off the first set of power switches and turns on the second. This continues all the way throughout the entire series of sensor arches, turning the previous area off and the current area on as you make your way through. And as I made my way through, you can see that I was equipped with a drill, boost mod, and small canister in the first area, two QT RTGs in the second area, a portable oxygenator and hoverboard in the third area, four canisters of hydrazine in the fourth, and a jetpack and a work light in the fifth. While this is certainly a bit slower than just grabbing these items for yourself, it does contain a nice wow factor. And if you regularly host friends, you can help them get fully kitted out and put on a little show for them as well. And if you really want to show off, you could even set up a storage area that has an auto arm that begins moving everything to other filtered auto arms that moves everything back to their original storage. Our next two courses will feature special guests, tactile object, and T-Hill 17. But before we get to those, Astroneer Academy is going to be on a two week break. Exodynamics has some exciting updates that were just released. I want to ensure our special guests have had some time to acclimate to any changes that are introduced before we ask them to speak on creative automation and computational automation. In the meantime, be sure to enter the PAL bundle giveaway via the link on your screen or in the description down below. This giveaway ends before our next Astroneer Academy video debuts, so this is my last chance to remind you to enter. Until next time, I'm Brandon, reminding you to stay vainglorious. Woo.